Elaine Shi from Thunder Token. She is a professor at Cornell and wrote the first research paper on Bitcoin and on smart contracts. So thanks, Elaine, for being with us today. Thank you for the introduction. I'm very excited to be here. Today, I'm going to talk about Thunder Token, and a very fast and high throughput cryptocurrency that our team is building. Now, 2017 is the year of the ICOs, and 2018 is the year of the dApps. There are many exciting dApps, for instance, games on blockchains, sharing economy, right? And like putting Uber and Airbnb on blockchains. And there are many others like decentralized exchanges, social networks, and so on and so forth. Okay, now there is a truth that everyone knows about, but maybe no one particularly enjoys talking about. That is, without a high performance blockchain infrastructure, none of these D apps will really take off to a large scale. Okay. For example, um, this is showing Ethereum transaction fees over time. And December last year, as we know, is an exciting time for our community. You know, CryptoKitties also came about in December. Um, and if you compare CryptoKitties with, let's say, social network games or mobile games, uh, it's not like they have a huge amount of volume, but nonetheless, it was sufficient to overload Ethereum. Um, back in December, Ethereum was 90% utilized, and their transaction fees were 1 million USD per day. OK, so now I believe that the scalability problem is the, one of the biggest and most exciting challenges our community faces today. And um, our company, Thunder Token, uh, we believe that we have the best technology to overcome this um, problem. And even with a single shard, we will be able to have 100 times more throughput than today's blockchains, and we will be able to confirm transactions in less than a second. OK, so in today's talk, I'm going to focus on the consensus protocol that enables such a fast cryptocurrency. Uh, it's called Thunderella. Uh, unfortunately, I won't have time to cover the incentives and the governance policies and everything else. I will only talk about the consensus protocol. OK, so to uh, understand the consensus, let me first try to describe the technical problem that we are trying to solve. OK. And the problem we are trying to solve is called state machine replication. It's also called a linearly ordered lock or consensus. Uh, in the rest of this talk, all these terms mean roughly the same thing. Uh, imagine we have a set of servers. In this case, we actually have a classical scenario. We have Google Wallet servers. These servers would like to agree on a linearly ordered lock of transactions. OK. Now, there are two uh, properties that we care about, namely consistency and liveness. Consistency says that all the honest servers must agree on the lock. So it could be that your lock progresses a little faster than mine. That's OK, but we must nonetheless agree. And liveness says that when an honest client submits a transaction, it will appear in every honest node's lock very soon. Right? It's not like we want to wait an hour for our coffee or something. OK, now. At first sight, this seems like a very boring problem. Well, what is so difficult about building a linearly ordered lock? OK. Um, indeed, if all the servers, they're honest and they correctly follow the protocol, the problem is indeed trivial. But what makes it difficult is when some of these servers can be corrupt. For instance, they have malware, and the adversary can exploit the malware. And now these corrupt servers can behave arbitrarily and devi deviate arbitrarily from the protocol. And even so, we would like that the remaining set of servers still satisfy these security properties. OK, so that is the problem we are trying to solve. Now, as it turns out, state machine replication is not a new problem. It has been around for a long time, and people in the distributed systems community have been working on it for 30 years. And if you look at the infrastructure for all these Silicon Valley companies, everyone actually deploys a state machine replication protocol, right? For instance, many companies use Apache Zookeeper, which is like a, a variant of Paxos. Uh, when we, uh, traditionally, when we talk about consensus, the kind of scenario we have in mind is exactly what I talked about. There's a single organization like Google or Facebook. There are a dozen nodes. And these nodes are connected um, using a fast local area network. OK, so as I said, consensus isn't a new problem. But what is new here is the large scale. right? With cryptocurrencies, we are talking about thousands of nodes to millions of nodes. And as it turns out, consensus on a large scale is very much a different beast. 
it's a much more challenging problem. And this perhaps explains why you know, all these ICOs out there, everyone's inventing and rolling their own uh, consensus protocol. But at the end of the day, you know, consensus is just as tricky and as subtle as crypto protocols. And we know you, know, you shouldn't be rolling your own crypto implementation. So why is it the case that everyone wants to roll their own consensus implementation? So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to answer two questions. Number one, as I said, why, despite 30 years of work in this area, there still isn't a dream large-scale consensus protocol? And number two, I'm going to tell you about what I believe to, the, uh, to be the dream large-scale consensus protocol. OK, so let's start with one. To see why um, we, still haven't, we still don't have a dream protocol, and it helps to understand the consensus landscape. Uh, roughly speaking, there are two broad classes of approaches towards consensus. There's classical, you know, like PBFT and Paxos. That's what these companies, Google, Facebook, deploy. And, and there's blockchains. So for classical protocols, um, if there is enough network bandwidth, then these protocols are fast most of the time because you confirm transactions in constant number of rounds. Um, but these protocols are very complex. And complexity makes it you know, difficult to maintain. It's difficult to implement. Um, and you may also know that uh, some of these classical protocols, they aren't incredibly scal scalable to a large number of nodes. OK, so the second class of approaches is blockchains. And obviously, the first blockchain-style consensus is Nakamoto, which is you know, the consensus protocol behind Bitcoin. OK, so interestingly, uh, blockchains actually they're not only just an empirical success, they're actually a mathematical breakthrough because we now understand the mathematics behind these blockchain-style consensus protocols fundamentally depart from classical. OK. Um, well, when we talk about blockchains, they have two, at least two main advantages. One is that they're extremely simple. right? The protocol is you always look for the longest chain, and you try to extend the longest chain. And the protocols have empirically proven to be robust on a large scale. Um, but the main drawback is that these protocols are slow, right? In Bitcoin, every block is 10 minutes, and we have to wait for six blocks. And that means I have to wait for an hour for my coffee. OK. Um, you may also be worried about energy waste, right? Because many of these protocols imply proof of work. But for this talk, I'm going to ask you to set this problem aside, because we already know how to overcome the proof of work problem, right? That there are many works that show how to construct proof of stake blockchains that emulate the mathematics of Nakamoto's blockchain. OK, so whenever I talk about blockchains in the rest of the talk, it can be proof of stake, it can be proof of work. OK, so this is the landscape. And obviously, you know, neither classical or blockchain will address our need. And therefore, the, the question is, what is the dream protocol for large-scale consensus? And that's what I will try to answer. And here's the plan. I'm going to first start by explaining classical consensus. And at some point, I'll get stuck. And when I get stuck, I'm going to try to uh, combine the best of both worlds. OK. So let's get started. Uh, in this picture, we have Vitalik. Who, who, we all know Vitalik, right? He's going to be the leader. And we have a committee. Let's say it's a committee of stakeholders. Uh, and in this case, they are superheroes, right? So some of these. Uh, committee members can be corrupt, like Loki is corrupt in this case. The leader can also be corrupt, by the way. OK, I'm going to describe to you an extremely simple voting-based protocol. And I'm going to try to explain some of the properties of the voting-based protocol. OK, so here's how it works. Vitalik is going to make a proposal to everyone. The proposal contains a transaction or a batch of transactions. It's tagged with the sequence number. Right? Remember, we are building a linearly ordered lock. The sequence number is going to tell you exactly where in the lock the transaction is going to land. OK, so in, in the whole protocol, there are many little instances of this uh, little protocol. But let's focus on a single instance right now. OK, Vitalik makes a proposal. Now, step number two, everyone votes. Uh, a vote is a signature on the proposal, right? Uh, in this case, Vitalik proposed a golden transaction. And if you are honest, you are supposed to vote on the golden transaction. And in this case, because Loki is corrupt, he didn't follow the protocol. He instead voted on a red transaction. And he also voted on a blue transaction. OK, now step number three. 
everyone will vote until they hear enough votes on the same transaction, and at this moment, they can confirm the transaction. Okay. The most important thing to remember about the protocol is that all these nodes are going to vote uniquely for every sequence number. For every sequence number, I'm going to wait till Vitalik sends me the first proposal, and I'm going to vote on that proposal and only that proposal. Okay. And I'm now going to argue to you, um, given that this is the invariant, we have consistency. But before doing that, I have to describe uh, the parameters. Right? So imagine we have n nodes in total, uh, among which f of them are corrupt. We are assuming n equal to 3f plus 1, meaning less than one-third are corrupt. And in this case, I claim we only have to wait for 2f plus 1 votes. In other words, we need to wait for two-thirds of the committee to vote. And once we wait for so many notes, votes, we can confirm. Okay, here's a very simple consistency proof. Imagine Spider-Man, in this case, has heard 2f plus 1 votes on the red transaction, and Iron Man has heard 2f plus 1 people voting on the orange transaction. Now let's look at these two sets, the red set of people and the orange set of people. And if you think about it, if n is equal to 3f plus 1, these two sets must intersect at at least an honest node. And now recall the invariant I talk, talked about. Also, by the way, this is just from a very simple pigeonhole principle. There's nothing fancy about it. So now remember, if you are honest, you vote uniquely, and we can therefore conclude that the red transaction must be equal to the orange. So this is the consistency proof. Uh, in particular, the consistency proof doesn't rely on the leader being honest. Even when the leader is corrupt, we still have consistency. The only thing we rely on is that honest nodes vote uniquely. Okay. Now, so what does this protocol give us? This very simple protocol. When Vitalik is honest, everything's good. We have both consistency and liveness. Consistency I've already explained. Liveness because, you know, if Vitalik's honest, he's going to propose the same transaction to everyone and everyone's going to vote on the same thing. So eventually, if you wait long enough, you'll collect enough votes, and you'll confirm and make progress. So what about the case when Vitalik is corrupt? In this case, we, have, we still have consistency, as I've already explained, but we don't have liveness. And why is this the case? Right? So for instance, Vitalik can simply just crash. He can also make different proposals to, to different people. In this case, everyone's going to be voting for a different thing. And you can wait and wait, but you never collect enough votes on the same transaction. So therefore, you can get stuck. OK, so now it seems like we are all good. But the crux of the problem is to resolve the live liveness issue when the leader is corrupt. So how can we resolve this liveness issue? Well, in all these classical protocols like PBFT, Byzantine Paxos, this is done through a very complicated recovery path. I don't want to have to explain how it works. Um, but essentially, a lot of these classical style consensus protocols, they have similar structure, right? There's a normal path that typically consists of uh, multiple rounds of such voting. And when the normal path fails, you go to this very complicated re recovery path. So from a systems perspective, right, if you think about it, you want that Almost all the time, your system should be in the green part, should be operating in the green part. But if you look at the code, most of the code is here, and that's where all the bugs are. OK. Um, and what does this complexity mean in practice? Like, for instance, Chain.com um, is a San Francisco-based company. They, they're rolling blockchain solutions for Visa. They chose to implement only the normal path. They're basically giving up on this. But what this means is that when the, this normal path fails, they have to do all of this stuff, this stuff manually, which, you know, if you are looking at a deployment with 100 banks, you have to go to all these banks, sync their locks, and then reboot, rebootstrap the protocol. So this is going to be very painful. OK, so now we are stuck. And now it's the time to try to combine the best of both worlds. Our idea is very simple. This is the classical style consensus. We are going to ditch this very complicated part, replace it with a very simple blockchain. And this will be our high-level idea. It's called Thunderella. I'm going to 
tell you how to actually instantiate the idea in a provably correct manner. Uh, I'm often going to use the terminology, the fast path and the slow chain. Right? The slow chain can be any standard blockchain like Bitcoin, Ethereum, but it can also be proof of stake blockchain. OK, before I tell you in detail how this works, um, our goal is to uh, almost all the time, we live in the fast path, and we can confirm transactions in two to three uh, network round trips. And we don't have to wait even for a single block interval. So in the fast path, we almost rarely use the blockchain at all. OK, only when, you know, let's say you are under attack, things are not so good. Um, but still, even in these cases, it's not the end of the world because we can always fall back to the underlying slow chain and we can always fall back to the slow chain security and performance, you know, just like today. Okay, just to quickly recall the scenario, we have a leader, we have a blockchain. It can be proof of work, it can be proof of stake. And there's a leader and there's a committee, right? So I'm going to punt on the leader and committee election mechanism. I'm going to ask you to... Uh, you know, take a leap of faith and believe that there's a mechanism to elect a leader and maybe a committee of stakeholders who will participate in the fast path. And the, the committee can rotate over time, and, and so can the leader. Okay. Now, to get our worst case security guarantees, we only need to assume that the blockchain miners are majority honest. So if this is proof of work, it means majority honest in compute power. If it's proof of stake, majority honest in stake. We are also going to assume that the committee is also majority honest. OK. We don't have to assume anything about the leader. The leader doesn't have to be honest for us to get worst case guarantees. Um, let me kind of um, help recall how the fast path works. This I kind of already explained in the beginning. But right now, I will try to highlight what happens when there are multiple of these instances. There are multiple sequence numbers. OK, so remember, Vitalik makes proposal. Everyone votes. And so now, OK, we have these different sequence numbers. OK, I'm going to introduce a new notion called notarize. If a transaction has votes from three quarters of the committee, it's going to be called notarize. So I've changed the threshold a little bit. Because right now, we want to tolerate minority corruption instead of one third. Right? Earlier, it was one third. But now, it's minority corruption. So the threshold has to be three quarters. So in this case, one, two, three are notarized. Four is missing. And five and six are notarized, too. Uh, in a cryptocurrency system, you need to process the transaction in a linear order. Otherwise, there can be double spending. Right? For instance, four and five can be conflicting transactions. So in this case, you can only process the, this prefix. And for the lack of a better term, I'm going to call this the maximal lucky sequence. So the maximal lucky sequence is what you can output and confirm. All right. So everything's going to be all good when the leader's honest. And remember, the problem we are trying to solve here is the liveness issue when the leader's corrupt. OK. So how can we solve the liveness issue well, so far, we haven't used the underlying slow chain yet, right? So we have got to use the underlying slow chain. And, and we are going to use the slow chain for two purposes. First, we will collect evidence to detect when the fast path fails. And we when we have detected that the fast path has failed, we initiate a fallback procedure to go back to the slow chain. And people can still post transactions to the slow chain and the system doesn't stop. You just have slower performance. And then from the slow chain, you can always try to rebootstrap the fast path. OK, so I'm going to explain, number one, how to do this detection, and number two, how to do the fallback. So first, how do we detect fast path failure? The challenge here is that we need a mechanism that's robust. In other words, um, malicious nodes should not be able to implicate an honest leader. You don't want to have like denial of service attacks, right? OK, so how does this work? Here's our idea. Let's say normally when the system is operating you know, in the fast path, the committee is going to sign a notarized hash of the fast path lock every now and then. And they're going to post this hash to the slow chain. And this is called a heartbeat, right? A heartbeat is some, something like a checkpoint. 
So every now and then, you keep posting these checkpoints to the slow chain. And normally, notice that everything is confirmed on the fast path, and we barely use the slow chain at all. The only way we are using the slow chain is to post these heartbeats. OK. Now, suppose at some point, I notice that k blocks have gone by without any heartbeat. So k is like a security parameter. Like for Ethereum, it can be like 37. It can be 300, depending on you know, your level, the level of confidence needed. Um, so this means that something is wrong right, with the fast path. Either the leader has crashed, is no longer making proposals, or maybe the leader is censoring transactions, and the committee have discovered that, and you know, they are complaining, uh, about, complaining about this, and they have stopped signing. So in all of these cases, the heartbeat will stop. And when the heartbeat stop, we want to fall back to the slow chain. OK, so how do we do the fall back is the second question. So the problem we are trying to solve is the following. So let's say now we all decide to fall back. But at this moment, your fast path lock can be a little longer okay. than mine. right? In this case, for instance, um, Spider-Man's network is a little slower. So he believes the fast path lock ends at 3, but Iron Man believes that it ends at 6. And we have to reach an agreement before we fall back to the slow chain, and, and then we can use the slow chain to continue confirming transactions. So how, we, how can we reach this agreement? If you think about the problem, you'll soon realize that this actually is an agreement problem in itself. And here we need both consistency and liveness. We can no longer punt on liveness anymore. OK. So again, we are going to use the slow chain for help. And we are going to introduce what is called the grace period. And the grace period consists of, again, k number of blocks, where k is a security parameter. Right? Think of k as, let's say, 300 for Ethereum. OK, so how do we use the grace period? So OK, suppose everyone wants to fall back. The first thing we do is to stop participating on the fast path. We stop signing. And now we are going to tell each other um, what, what is the fast path log that I see. And number three, we will post all of the notarized but uncheckpointed transactions to the slow chain. Right? So, so remember, every heartbeat is a checkpoint. And the checkpoint is kind of already finalized. And I only have to post the transactions that are notarized but not checkpointed yet to the slow chain. By the end of the grace period, everyone will have agreed on the, where the fast path log ends. And that is going to be actually longer than anyone's fast path log, because if you have already confirmed the transaction, you don't want to roll it back. OK. So now we have reached this agreement. And of course, we can now just fall into the slow chain and confirm transactions on the slow chain. So to sum summarize, uh, here's how the fallback works. We use the slow chain to detect when the fast path has failed. And when it has failed, we use a grace period to fall back into the slow chain and achieve a provable security. OK. So just to quickly recall the property, um, to get our worst, worst case guarantees, the security guarantees, we only need to assume basically majority honest. And the important thing I want to stress is that the leader doesn't have to be trusted. The leader is some, something just like an accelerator, right? Its only job is to acceler accelerate the protocol. And even if the leader is arbitrarily malicious, the only thing it can do is to slow down the protocol. It cannot break consistency. It cannot stop the protocol either. OK. And when things are good, let's say the leader is honest and online, and more over three quarters of the committee are honest and online, then you know, we are happy. We live in the fast path, and everything gets confirmed very quickly. OK, so just to recap, here's a two-sentence summary of the protocol. You, know, you can reconstruct it yourself at home, given these two sentence, uh, this two-sentence description. When things are good, we have a single round of voting in the fast path. When things go bad, we use the slow chain to do a fallback. And when we are in the slow chain, we can always bootstrap the fast path. OK, so now, of course, I haven't explained a lot of these other details, like how to do the leader and committee election. Um, we have other practical optimizations. I haven't talked about incentive, but all of these are in our paper. OK, so before I conclude, I want to kind of um,
talk about some of the high-level insights we have gained. You know, why, let's say, after 30 years of work, there isn't a dream protocol, but we can suddenly claim we have the dream protocol, right? There has to be some deeper insights. And if you look at all these classical consensus protocols, they have an, an asynchronous fast path and an asynchronous fallback. So by the way, uh, so an asynchronous protocol is not aware of the maximum network delay. So the protocol doesn't know how long it takes to deliver messages. And when you try to work with asynchrony directly, it makes your life very difficult. Right? This is a challenging model to work in. Um, but we are kind of, you know, we baited and switched, but we are actually using a synchronous protocol underneath. So a blockchain is a synchronous protocol, right? Because we have to uh, parameterize the block interval. And there are mathematical proofs that show the block interval has to be, let's say, 60 times the maximum narrow delay to tolerate 49% attack. OK. So a synchronous protocol um, basically is allowed to know the maximum narrow delay. So th this makes you know, protocol design a lot easier. And the interesting thing is like, in all of these classical approaches, people use asynchronous protocols because the common wisdom is that synchronous protocols are too slow. Like in Google, Facebook scenario, they want like um, microsecond latency. So even, of course, like waiting for this synchrony round is not acceptable, right? Like, um, you know, the synchrony round has to be parameterized conservatively because if the assumption is violated, then you don't get consistency um, at all. Okay, but we are kind of, saying, you know, this common wisdom is not necessarily true. You can be a synchronous protocol and fast almost all the time, right? So that's our fundamental realization. And, you know, if you look at Thunderella, most of the time it actually lives in an asynchronous world. That's why we are very fast. But it's actually fundamentally a synchronous protocol, and that's why we can be extremely simple. Now, there are some other efforts that also maybe are trying to do something similar. For instance, if you look at Algorand, you are going to hear about the talk maybe later this afternoon, right? So Algorand, if you look at the protocol carefully, they also actually have an asynchronous fast path and a synchronous fallback. But our biggest revelation and the most important revelation is under this paradigm, both the fast path and the fallback can be extremely simple, right? And let me skip this, and let me conclude by saying, you know, in a large-scale distributed system, simplicity is your best friend. Okay, and our company is hiring. We are based in the Silicon Valley. We are 10 plus people now. If you want to work with a you know, very strong technical team, or if you are a D-app developer wanting to work on our platform, maybe you want to make your you know, Thunder Kitty, the next generation, or the most sexy, attractive kitties, you're welcome to email us. Thank you. <laughs>